Well, thanks for sticking around once uh, the beer's gone. Actually, I think there's still a bit more. Actually, on that subject, because my voice was going a bit, I found from hard-worn experience that when my voice is going, a bit of alcohol does help. So I'm going to be drinking some as we go. So as we get towards the end, if it just gets much too complicated, either it's because the language is, is going the wrong way or it's because I've had too much of this. So <laughs> you, you be, the, you be the, the judge of that. So we, we got up to, but not including, C++ 14. Now before the break, obviously we covered C++ 11, which means that we covered two language versions, two and a half if you're, you're being generous. We've got uh, four more to go. So <coughs> we'll see how, how that goes. But I think that we're going to be finishing a little bit ahead because I, I originally timed this for, say, a non-C++ audience. We've been skipping over some bits, but we'll maybe slow down as we get to the modern age a little bit more. Uh, I have some bonus material that we might be able to look at at the end as well. We'll see how that goes. So, okay, we looked at C++ 11. We saw how that introduced us into the, like the, the new age of, of C++, sort of bringing us back up into, into relevance, avoiding that Oldsmobile moment where we slip into irrelevancy. And we also decided to adopt this train model of standardization, where we'll, we'll see how it goes, but maybe every three years we would introduce a new standard. That means that we had a roadmap, and we knew that the next version would be C++14. And I actually remember going to a talk in the early 2010s where they were talking about, well, what's coming in C++14 and what's coming in C++17? We had an idea right back then what was going to be the next two language versions. Of course, half of it didn't actually come across, but we'll get to that. Nonetheless, 2014, we did, on schedule, release C++14. What was in it? Well, that big gap between C++98 and C++11, while we had to undo a load of mistakes we made, there was still a lot in it. It was a huge release. C++14 was always going to be a smaller release. And in fact, in many ways, we consider it more of a bug fix release. Not really, not just bugs, but just refining what we already had. Just sort of rounding it out a bit. So things like, uh, well, make unique is maybe the, the prime example. Really, it should have been the C++11. So C++11 introduced unique pointer and shared pointer. Now, shared pointer also got make shared. One of the advantages of make shared, which will create the object, afford your constructor arguments, and then give you back a shared pointer, is that it reduces the possibility of a leak if one of the evaluations of your arguments throws an exception. So exactly the same should have applied to unique pointer, but for some reason just got overlooked. We didn't have a make unique. It was easy enough to write your own. I know I did. Who here wrote their own make unique? few hands, yep. Many of us did it. It was, it was fairly easy once you had all the parts, but much nicer to have it in the language. C++14 gave us that. Little thing, but yeah, it's, a, it's a nice thing to have. A lot of it was like that, just little, little refinements. Uh, another one, auto lambdas. So we've got lambdas in C++11. Big feature on its own right, we've, we've looked at that. But you always had to specify all of the, the types of the arguments. There was no templated lambdas, of course. C++14 go for those. So instead of a, the template syntax, because we already now had auto for type deduction, we use auto for uh, generic types in the lambdas themselves. Much nicer. Why didn't we have that for function templates as well? Later, as we'll see, we do. <laughs> but C++14, they came to, to lambdas. So, yeah, lots of little rounding out of things. Uh, another one that I like, uh, auto return types. So you stick auto at the start. Actually, we had auto at the start of a function definition in C++11, but you still had to specify the return type using the trailing return type syntax with the arrow. I've done a whole talk on why I actually prefer that anyway. I'm not going to cover that now. But in C++14, you didn't have to specify that type if it could be deduced. A little thing, but you know, nice. There was more, of course. Again, lots of little things. They all add up to a nice release, but nothing really earth-shattering. Um, you know, things like digit separators. Just, just makes long numbers a bit more readable, but okay, good. 
So I don't actually have a lot more to say about C++14 other than nobody particularly dislikes it, but it's just like a stepping stone onto to bigger things. So back when I saw that talk on what's coming in C++14, what's coming in C++17, C++17 was always billed as the next big release. You know, all the big things are going to go into 17. And because of that, we put up with 14 just being a, a little minor increment. Because we knew we were still waiting for the big things, including concepts, for example. And actually, by that time, we were expecting a few big things. Um, so concepts, maybe coroutines, ranges, modules. Um, and there was another one I'm forgetting, but we'll come to it. So let, let's skip on to C++17, see what we actually got. Well, it turns out we didn't get concepts, we didn't get coroutines, we didn't get ranges, we didn't get modules, uh, uh, contracts maybe was the other one. None of those big features actually made it into 17 after all. And so initially, it seemed like a big disappointment. Like we put up with the small release, C++14, because we were waiting for this one. And it didn't deliver. Except, actually, when the dust settled and we had a look at what we actually did get, it turned out to be quite a good release in its own right. Yeah, it didn't have those big headline features, but it had quite a lot of really nice stuff. So let's have a look. In fact, let's go back to our earlier example. Remember we cleaned up our vector uh, so that, yeah, we didn't have to do all those pushbacks. We did it all in one line. It's a huge difference in C++11. Now in 17, we went that just that little bit further. See now, we didn't have to specify the template type. We have something called CTAD, uh, which is, well, put it up, class template argument deduction. We've had that since C17, but who, who sort of remembers that we even have this? Yeah, we, we forget. It's maybe not a huge feature, but it's really nice actually. Just sort of completes that. Don't specify things you don't need to uh, feel. So I'm even closer to Python now. CTAD itself, to do it right, it's actually a bit complex behind the scenes, but in use generally makes things a bit simpler. It's a common theme in all of this. Let's um, look at uh, another example. So based on what we were looking at before, we were converting integers to strings. Let's do it the other way around. You've got a string that um, you know, may hold a representation of an integer. We want to convert it to an int. Again, we can use a string string um, trick. We do have std from string. We're going to ignore that for the moment. Now, bear in mind, this is C++17. What can we do better than this? So we're taking a std string by const reference. So if you remember back from the C++98 days, that's always been the best practice. Take potentially larger objects by const reference. Potentially, with move semantics, we could take it by value and then, then move it. I don't think that really applies here. Const reference seems to be the right thing to do. But if you pass this a, say, a, a char star array, string literal, or maybe in some, some other string type that you've got, well, you're going to pay a copy cost. So just to convert it to an int, you've first got to convert it to a different string. So of course, we introduce string view to solve that problem. String view itself is ridiculously simple. Well, okay, the standard implementation has some <laughs> complexities to it, of course. But conceptually, it's really simple. Who here has written their own version of something like string view before C++17? Yeah, got a few hands. I've, I've done about two or three versions myself. Really nice to have it in the, in the language. In fact, a big part of C++17 was taking these commonly used types and making them what we call vocabulary types. These are types that we use not, not just very frequently, but we also pass them across API boundaries very often. They make our APIs much nicer to work with. Yeah, I've written my own string view. I called it string ref. But of course, that didn't interoperate very well with other libraries that maybe had their own versions. So really important to get these sort of types in the language. C++17 really delivered there. Let's look at another thing that it gave us. Continuing with this example, what's... Um, What's the big thing that's missing here? What, why is this not a particularly good function for converting a string into an integer? Anyone? Error handling. Error handling, yeah. 
what happens if the, in, the, the string doesn't actually have a good representation of an integer? There's no way to communicate that. Now, we could, of course, throw an exception. We've had exceptions for, for decades at this point. But that's actually not a very good fit for this sort of thing. You very often want to do this sort of thing where, well, you don't know what the string is. So you want to say, well, do you contain an integer? If so, what is it? Don't do the work twice. And if not, I want to take a different path. You want to do more control flow rather than, I know this is a, an integer. It's an error if it's not. So you want to be a little bit, little bit different. So in the old days, maybe we would have been tempted to put the result in a, in a reference type. Uh, reference parameter, what we might call an out parameter. So we'll, we'll pass the, the result out into a reference that you pass in. And then the return value is free to be used for you know, your, your error signaling, whether it's a Boolean or something else. That works, but it's a bit ugly, a bit error prone. And of course, you, know, you can forget to check. <laughs> That's very easy to do. So one other thing we've got in C17 is no discard. So if you do have something that you really need to check on your return type, please, please use no discard. And as of C++20, I won't mention it there, so I'll mention it now. You can, you can provide a message as well to, to say why you shouldn't discard it. It could be useful. So we actually got attributes in C++11, I think. I didn't check that. I think it was 11. But we didn't have many back then. I think it was C++14 introduced, um, deprecated. We saw that on a slide. No discard was maybe the, the first particularly useful one we got. You really should be using this. But it's still not a great API. You know, reference return values is, is not a good, good way to do things. So, of course, we've got std optional. This is a much better way to do it. So now we can say, well, either we converted it to an integer, in which case here it is, or we didn't, in which case it's an empty optional. And actually, the, the usage is, is really straightforward. If we return the actual um, integer, it automatically converts. Otherwise, we can return a, a null opt. And to use it, there's a pointer semantics. So we can, we can test it as the same way that we can test a pointer. So if it has a value, we haven't had to use a separate initializer. Um, and we can dereference it like a pointer. And if it doesn't have a value, we can just go into the else. You know, we know all this, but it's just nice to see it coming in at this point. But sometimes this is still not quite enough. Maybe you, you need to provide more information about why you couldn't produce that value. You know, was it that it was just a, um, a bad integer? It was close to it? Or, or We don't know. In some cases, it's more obvious than others. But <clears throat> there's no way with optional to put any information on the error side. Now, C17, we did get std variant, which you could use for this. So variant, of course, is a <clears throat> closest we got to a, a real discriminated union in C++. So something which is one of several alternate types and a way to distinguish what those types are, uh, sometimes called a, uh, a sum type. So here we've got a variant of int or std error domain. Sorry, domain error. Um, doesn't have to be domain error, just shows that. And now we've got a way to provide a message along with the, the error to say why, why it failed. Not particularly useful in this case, but just for illustration. That works. Um, in usage, though, it starts to get a bit verbose. So to test which alternate type you have, you can use holds alternative, alternative. There's a couple of other things you can do as well, but that's sort of the, the canonical way. Um, to get the, the value out, you use std get with the type. Uh, again, there's a way to do it by index as well. You know, it all works, but uh, I do think that while it's good to have std variant in the language, it's such a useful concept. Really, this should be built into the language. We're not quite there yet. So for now, what we're stuck with was std variant. For error handling, though, it's, um, it's really not a good fit, I think. It's, it's just um, too, too much boilerplate. I mean, really, the amount of noise in that bottom section is something like, you know, 80% error handling boilerplate. 
I've done other talks on this that go into it in much more depth. You should see those for more details, but yeah, it's, uh, we, we could do better. But I've at least introduced stud variant, which is another really valuable if for both vocabulary type in C17. Now you notice here, so rather than with, uh, if I go back, with optional, we could declare our optional return value and test it in a single if statement because it has those pointer semantics. When we went to std variant, we had to do those on separate lines because we had to first get our result and then, then test it. Except that another thing that came in in C17 was the init statement. So now you can do the assignment and then the test all within the, the if statement itself. And the advantage to that is that our result object there is now scoped to within the if-else, which means that you don't have to worry about it leaking out to enclosing scopes. So that's another nice little refinement, but we've got that in C17. So there's plenty more that we've got in 17 that we haven't really talked about. So we mentioned no discard, optional, string view, variant. Um, there's a lot more we can say about variant, including if we do have like more types, how do we see which one each one is and what to do with it. We generally use std visit for that. Who here has written their own visitor pattern implementation? <laughs> Would have thought there'd be more. There's a few hands though. Uh, I, I call it the unwelcome visitor because it's always more code than you wanted. But we've at least got that in the standard library for variant. So it's a lot more succinct than, than it would have been otherwise. But it's still not really a, a very ergonomic way to, to deal with variants. As I say, there's stuff coming in the pipe. We're not quite there yet, even with 23, but um, we're going in the right direction. We've got even more cons expra. Uh, I, didn't, I skipped over it in the C14 slide, but cons expra got relaxed quite a lot in C14. Um, I think we've got variables and loops, at least, and certainly multiple return statements. C17, we've got even more. Um, again, I can't remember the details now. I might have overstated the C14, but it's evolving gradually to be more and more relaxed, more and more like normal code. But what we can't do in C17 is particularly memory allocation and exceptions. And that rules out quite a lot of useful code, particularly things like um, std vectors and maps and other containers at compile time. Still couldn't quite do that in 17, but we're getting there. Context has been this constantly evolving thing. Talking of which, if contextpr is actually quite a big thing in 17, if you're, particularly if you're a library writer or you're doing um, template metaprogramming or any of that sort of stuff, if contextpr can save you a ton of code because it's basically just an if that can happen at compile time. And the evaluation uh, only happens depending on, on the condition. I'm not gonna go into it in, in too much depth, but it's actually really powerful for replacing loads of the template metaprogramming code. Um, structured bindings was actually quite a surprise entry into C17. It came in at the 11th hour. Uh, I think pretty much after we thought the design of C17 was complete, it just got through the door. <laughs> and it turned out to be quite a big feature. If you don't use structured bindings, they're a way of, um, it's sort of part of a, a pattern matching syntax uh, the, 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 the structuring part, or you can think of it like um, Python has multiple return values. You can destructure them to multiple variables. Gives us a way to do that in the language in C++17 uh, before we may have had to use something like std tie. So all things that just make the language more um, nicer and more ergonomic to use, possibly except std variant, which makes it a bit more complex, but we'll brush that one under the carpet. Uh, fold expressions, again, I won't go into that in too much detail, but if you're not familiar, we've got variadic templates in C11, but you had to do sort of template metaprogramming type things to work with them. Fold expressions simplify a lot of that. And once you get used to the syntax, it's a lot simpler, but it is a new syntax. So, again, I'm not covering all of it here. It turned out to be quite a, quite a good release, certainly bigger than 14 but not as big as 
11, or as we'll see, 20. And it missed some of those big headline features. So, we come on to C20. Yeah, some of you got the, the references. Remember, we were promised con concepts, uh, ranges, modules, coroutines, contracts. What do we get? So, this version of the slide is from the first version I did of this talk back in 2019, early 2019, to be more specific. <laughs> And I was saying, yeah, the design is pretty much locked at this stage. This is what we're getting. Who can spot the mistake? <laughs> <laughs> Just shout it out. Oh, <laughs> yes. So contracts were in, and then they were out. And I was in the room when that happened. So, yeah. Contracts are a way of expressing preconditions, postconditions, invariants. Um, originally developed in the context of the language Eiffel. Um, but actually even C, and hence C++, has asserts, which you can use as a degenerate form of contracts. You can certainly express preconditions and, and things. Um, contracts would have been a way to um, be more nuanced about that, more controlled and uh, more expressive. Uh, a lot of people really, really, really want contracts, including me but we have to get it right. And it turned out, again, at the 11th hour, just like with concepts, we thought, actually, we can't quite agree what we actually mean. <laughs> and that was a bit of a problem. So, yeah, we took it out, decided to regroup, formed a study group around it, and thought, we'll try and get it in for 23. Um, last I heard, it's not ready for 23. So, we're hoping 26. <laughs> I've heard it may not even make 26, but... In the meantime, you can do it yourself, so uh, hopefully it's not too bad. But that, that was the, <laughs> the controversial story of C++20. But the good news is, we've got everything else. We've got ranges, we've got concepts, finally. Not quite C++11 concepts. Oh, sorry, C++ OX concepts. Um, we'll come back to that. We've got coroutines, and we've got modules. Um, most of these do come with some asterisks, though. So the only asterisk around concepts, I'd say quite, concepts has been a big success. Yeah, it's got some rough edges, but pretty much delivered. But C++ OX uh, had some extra features. Uh, this is what really caused the, the problems that eventually caused it to be pulled out. Uh, perhaps the biggest of those is what's called concept maps. Uh, who, who remembers concept maps? One or two people, yeah. Not very well known these days, so maybe we're not missing too much, but actually I think if we can eventually get them back in, it could be a big addition. So concepts themselves allow us to uh, limit or constrain our APIs uh, in a way that's also overloadable. So it replaces loads of really messy stuff we had before. Try to make our APIs ergonomic. That's really what it's about. Um, concept maps go a step further and say, well, okay, you don't quite match this constrained API, but I know how to adapt you so that you can. And that really opens up a lot of ways to interoperate bits of code that were never meant, were never designed to interoperate, but, but should. And I've seen this play out in other languages really well, but it has to be done properly. And C++ just makes things more complex. <laughs> so we haven't got that yet. Maybe we will one day. I don't know. But it's great that we've got concepts in the form that we have. And in fact, right up until, again, the 11th hour, it looked like we were going to have an even more cut down version of concepts. In particular, what we call the terse syntax, which allows us to say just um, auto and a constrained type, actually the other way around, um, rather than having to spell out you know, concepts and the, the more sort of template-like syntax. Didn't, like, didn't look like we were going to get that in, but we did. So now we have uh, a much more succinct way to specify not just concepts, but just general templates. Again, we've got the auto keyword like we had in C++14 with lambdas. We now have that for, for function templates, and class templates as well, because it's part of the ter terse concepts syntax. So we go even further and can constrain those template types. For example, we can say that this only 
conforms to a particular iterator category. And it will be a compiler error if it doesn't. And actually, I think I've got an example of that a bit later. So I'll hold off talking more about it. That's concepts. We've got so much more on here to talk about. Um, but I said some of these had asterisks. So let's go through those. Modules. We've got modules in C++20. It, so many of these came together right at the last minute. And we thought, finally, we got them in. But we've got the language feature. But modules really need uh, the ecosystem and, and build system support to really work. So you can put modules in your code and you won't be able to build it most of the time. Uh, if you're using Visual Studio, you might be able to. I think they have their own version. Um, CMake is starting to get some support, but we re really need some you know, joined up uh, specifications here. The trouble is, what we really need is a specification for how build systems should support modules. And unfortunately, that's not what we say um, is in the purview of the C++ standard. It's not something that we can actually specify in the standard document, just by design, just the ISO rules, really. So we can't standardize that. So the best we've done is set up a study group that will write a document suggesting that this is how things should be done and hope the build tool vendors will pick that up. And that study group was formed just before the pandemic. And then they sort of fell fairly quiet during the pandemic. I think they're picking up again now, mostly being driven by Bloomberg, actually. So hopefully we'll get there. But I've been saying for years, modules is going to be a C++ 23 feature. And I'm now revising that <laughs> to maybe C++ 26. We're not there yet which is unfortunate because modules, maybe even more than all of the other features here, has the power to completely transform the way that we actually write C++. Maybe not line by line, but the way that we build C++ projects. Um, we inherited the include uh, module uh, model from C, which is basically just copying and pasting text from one file into another. We know how that works. We know how error prone that can be, and all of the side effects of leaking definitions and build times and everything like that these two. Oh, I once did a, a test where I pre-compiled Hello World. I think it was on Windows at the time, but it's pretty much the same on any compiler. It may have done the same sort of thing. And the resulting file was so many hundreds of thousands of lines long <laughs> just because of that textual include, inclusion model. No wonder our build times are so bad. Modules has the ability, or the, the promise, to cut through all of that. Rather than textual inclusion, it's uh, just linking against a, a pre-built interface. It's not going to go deeper than that at this point. You probably know where, where that goes. But when we get it, it's going to be a big thing. So yeah, we've got modules, but we haven't got modules. But it's a start. Coroutines. Uh, it's one of my favorite features from 20, actually. I just did a talk on it just recently. And as a language feature, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Now, you may have seen coroutines in other languages, and it gets a little bit complex just in itself. It's a complex feature. In fact, it's, it's a way to express complex problems in their almost sim most simple form, if that makes sense. So you're taking a complex thing and getting the simplest version of it. Then you do it in C++. <laughs> <laughs> and you get all the complexities. Actually, this time, it's not really about references and, and stuff like that. It's more about that um, zero overhead principle. Don't pay for what you don't use. You can actually write coroutines that literally have zero overhead compared to writing the equivalent yourself, which is quite impressive when you consider what it's doing. Um, you you can also write coroutines that do have some overhead. You, you will trade that off. But yeah, we've achieved that zero overhead principle at the cost of uh, a lot of code. So if you've, who here has actually tried coroutines in C++? So a few hands. Uh, who here thinks it's simple? No, no hands? OK. Right, who's seen a talk on coroutines but still doesn't understand them? <laughs> More hands. OK. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I think most people 
they need to watch about two or three talks before it starts to, to sink in. Uh, certainly was the case for me. Uh, and I, I went in knowing how coroutines worked. I just needed to know how they worked in C++. Uh, and that takes three talks alone. That included my own, by the way. <laughs> so they're complex. They're made more complex by C++, but the real killer is they really need library support. Uh, if, if you've tried to use C++ contracts, you'll know that there's a lot of supporting code, boilerplate code, that could be in a library. Um, in some cases, more than others. And we don't have any library support. None at all. In C++20. So, you know, we were promised, yep, C++23, that's when that will be coming. We'll see. We'll see. But in C++20, coroutines are usable if you're prepared to put in the work. Um, but not for everyday application developers, I would say. Which is a shame. Um, Spaceship, on the other hand, goes completely the other way. It takes existing code and makes it simpler. <laughs> it's one of the only language features I know that that's, that's the case for. So what is Spaceship? Also known as the, the freeway comparison operator. So rather than having to spell out equals, not equals, less than, greater than, less than equals, greater than or equals, you can just write one Spaceship operator. It has three return values, well, three, re yeah, values you can return, and the compiler will synthesize the rest, which is great to start with. It can actually go further, and in many cases, if all of your members already support um, the freeway comparison, it will synthesize it for you without writing any code. So it takes your existing code and makes it better. So generally it's a big win. There's a few places where it interoperates badly, um, but I think overall, it, it's been a really nice feature. Um, what do we miss? Ranges. So we talked about iterators, how they're such a game changer in C++ 98. But they also have a few problems. We already saw how spelling out the, the long iterator types was tedious. There's ways to simplify that, but all the algorithms are specified in terms of, well, usually two or three iterators, it still gets a bit tedious. And they don't compose very well, uh, functionally compose. If you need to chain algorithms together, you'll generally have to pass some iterators in, get some out, store them, then pass those stored ones into another algorithm, and so on. Doesn't sound that bad, but when you look at what you can do in other languages where you can just chain all these operations together, uh, you can see, well, we're missing something. So with their simplest, ranges are just a way to take two iterators and put them together. So, well, this represents a range. And that's how they started out. Just that alone pretty much solves the composability problem because now you can pass in a range and get out a range. Pass that range onto another algorithm. You can compose. But ranges goes further than that. It gives you things like views and adapters, which actually let you do work without the intermediate containers you might have otherwise written. Like earlier when we did the conversion from integers to, to strings, and we needed an extra container. Well, if we wanted to do another conversion after that, we might even need an extra container. Well, we can do all that work along the way, chain them all together, and miss out all the intermediate steps. So in principle, ranges are really good. In practice, they're pretty good, but they've got some gaps. Just like with some of the other features, there's bits that got put off. Didn't quite make the cut. We'll do that later. Which is fine. Oh. <laughs> Talking of getting cut off. <laughs> did, we, did we go over time? <laughs> so I'm not going to repeat all those jokes that I told while the audio was off. We'll just assume that they were funny. That's, um, I think that's still recording, so doing a screen recording here, so we need to make sure that carries on. Okay, where do we get to? We're talking about ranges. I think we're pretty much done. We just said there's a few gaps. Um, I mean, one good example is just a little thing that was missing that would have been really nice is the zip uh, algorithm. Just takes two ranges and puts them together step by step. Um, but there's a few things where 
uh, the specification says, you know, you can do this. I don't have the example off the top of my head, but it sort of works in maybe 80% of cases, and then 20% of the cases, it would just fall over with a really hard to read error message, which is unfortunate because one of the things that Rangers was meant to do was to give us good error messages based heavily on concepts. So it's a shame that we still have some of those warts in it. They're gradually being addressed, but we're not quite there yet, even in 23. But it's, um, it's a big step forward. Most of, if not all, of the algorithms uh, have range versions alongside the existing iterator versions. So you can start using those straight away and just get the benefits of that first level. But some of the more advanced stuff, it's uh, a little bit rough around the edges for now. Um, the other thing I'll just point out is the context story continues. So in C++20, we finally got the ability to do memory allocations, or new and delete at least, it's not actually memory allocation, uh, and exceptions. At least you can write try catch. If an exception is actually thrown, then it's a compile error. But just supporting try catch actually gets us most of the way there. So we can now have context for a vector and map and string, which is a huge step forward for context for. Pretty much the only thing you can't do now is, is things that actually have side effects, uh, which, which may be as far as we go. So yeah, context for. We also have, I haven't really put it here, but const eval, the difference being context for can be executed at compile time. Whereas const eval must be executed at compile time. And sometimes you need to make that, that choice. I think I've already covered the fact that contract is out. So, oh, honorable mention to std format, which also made it in. It's the first step, at least, towards replacing IO streams. <laughs> so, inspired by the way you do formatting in Python, to try to make it easier safer and more performant all at the same time, which is great. Um, in C++20, it only really uh, works for formatting strings. Uh, we're working on getting it to work for input and output as well. That's the next step. Uh, a lot of work going on on std format. Um, Trying to remember what this example was for now. Oh yeah, I know. Okay, so. This is actually to demonstrate concepts. So imagine you have a function like this, with a template function called print that just takes a container, any container. So we're taking it as a template argument. So we can work with any container, just use a range-based for loop to iterate over, just put a bit, bit of syntax around it. So yeah, if you pass it a vector, and we call print on that, we'll get all the elements printed out. Great. I'm sure many of us have written code much like this. Trouble is, it's an open template. We can pass it something that's not a container, doesn't support range base four, and of course it won't compile, but you get the error sort of somewhere in the middle of the implementation, you know, where it tries to get iterators out of the container. So yeah, an instantiation of function template specialization um, constant, no viable, begin function available. It's, it's hard to really decipher from that what the problem is. So with concepts, we can say, okay, T is a template argument, but it has to be something that conforms to the input range concept, which itself supports the iterator model. So now, the error message, you still get an error message, but now it's saying you can't actually call the function print. So it's at the call of the function, you get the error. And it says constraint not satisfied. What's the constraint? Expansion of concept input range for t, where t is an int. OK, there's still a lot of words there. But it gets you to what the problem is much more clearly. And that's a big part of what concepts gives you. We could do things like this before, but there were really nasty workarounds, uh, Sphinx stuff. Um, this is, this is a much nicer way to do it. Where this goes even further is you can overload functions based on uh, concepts. So you can have a different function that works for different concepts. But we're not going to cover that for now. 
let's have a look at this example again. Remember when we talked about our vector events, converting them to strings using std transform of the lambda. So I mentioned ranges. Makes it much simpler just to compare that again. So we've got our, we're declaring our um, string vector and then reserving it up front and then calling transform and passing it to iterators. Now we can actually declare the string vector, transform it, and pipe it in all in one statement with no intermediate steps. This is much nicer. It takes a little bit of getting used to. It's like a new vocabulary to learn, but it's worth doing it because the code is so much simpler. And better still, remember I said about composability? Putting an extra step in, you can just see it there in the, in the workflow. So they were just filtering out any values that are uh, not divisible by two. Just that bit alone changes. Everything else stays the same. That's how it should be. That's not how it has been. So that's the power of ranges. OK, we still have one more language version to get to. I let the whole thing play. I like this bit. And it gives me a chance to have a drink. So we're going into the future now. We're not that far off. <laughs> when I first put these slides together, it was still four years away. It's quite scary, really. Ah, oh, another animation. Oh, we'll skip this one. Right. C plus plus 23. Now, we are now at the stage where I was the first time I gave this talk for C plus plus 20. The design of C plus plus 23 is pretty much frozen. So we should know what we've got in it. This is my slide from 2019. <laughs> These are the things we were expecting to get in 23. Right, this is what we got. <laughs> That's not 100% true, um, the semester is, but yeah, pretty much none of those things got in. Some of these were admittedly optimistic meta classes. I didn't really think that would be in 23. Even reflection was a bit optimistic, but I was hopeful. And, and pattern matching, but yeah, this was a bit disappointing. Obviously, that's not the whole story. Most of the things that have made it in, I didn't even know about back then. Some of them I did. Let's have a look. These are some of the important things. There's a few there. We'll get to those, but let's just write in what we didn't get. Uh, so I, I slightly modified this. I said no coroutine libraries, but actually it's no coroutine task libraries. Um, so the last minute update, uh, I heard that uh, coroutine generators have made it in. They still got to be, had the wording finalized, but it's been prioritized that a std generator for coroutines will make it in. So we'll be able to write the simple forms of coroutines with library support in C++23. I think that's a big step. So I'm glad about that. But no async task libraries yet. Still no contracts. Uh, no executors. Now, we haven't really talked about executors. I mentioned back in the C11 segment that we had the start of support for parallel programming. We've got the memory model. We've got the, some basic primitives like mutex and, and things like that. But we needed some higher level stuff. Obviously, we've got coroutines, which help with some async workflows. Executors were meant to, to get us all the way there. A full async workflow um, framework. And we were talking about those from, I remember hearing talks before C14 about what executors were going to look like. And every year they changed <laughs> until maybe a year ago or two, I can't remember. We decided actually that wasn't really going to work out. So we switched to a new model uh, called std execution um, based on this, this idea called uh, senders receivers. It's the same sort of idea, just a different approach to it. And uh, there's a Facebook, I think, library that implements this idea. There's a huge uh, amount of interest in getting std execution into C++23. It was, I think, the number one priority, at least for the library side. And it looked like up until the last minute it was going to make it, but it didn't. 
So yeah, we still don't have executors or still execution, maybe 26. But what did we get? Okay, there's a few things here. I'm going to demonstrate some of them. Um, context for almost all the things I should forget now. What else we've got on the context per front? So I'm not going to talk about that. Maybe the headline feature, which I don't have an example for, is deducing this, which I thought was going to be a small feature, but actually it's got a lot of implications. Uh, deducing this is a way of, well, let's, let's take a step back. We all know that this pointer that we've had since the early days of C++. Should have been a reference, but it's a pointer. This might actually change that. But it's always been implicit. When you call a method, you've got your this pointer there. But it can actually have a different value category. It's always a pointer, but it might be a const pointer. It may even be a, uh, an R value. Um, it all depends on what you put at the end of the method signature. So if you put const, it's a const pointer. And if you put uh, an R value reference, it's an R value. But that's the only control we had over it. Another problem we had, how, how often have you had to write uh, a const and a non-const version of the same method? Well, I saw a couple of hands go up, but I actually asked how many times. Anyway, <laughs> it's something we have to do, and we either duplicate the code, or we, we call the, uh, the non-const version from the const version. But that's just const and non-const, and then you throw in our values as well, and, um, there's a few other things that we should put in, but we never do. And I think you actually need about five or six different versions to do it properly. A lot of the standard library types do. If only there was a way that we could actually make the, this pointer into a template argument. And that's what did you see in this allows us to do. We can finally specify that this argument as an argument to the function, much like you do in Python. Again, going back to Python. And because, because you can make it a template argument, you can also deduce the value category, and you can make it a reference. This opens up, turns out, a load of things. So the original motivation was just for reducing that duplication. But it turns out you can do things like, um, well, CRTP. Who knows CRTP? Quite a few hands. OK. I know what sort of crowd we've got now. <laughs> the curiously recurring template pattern, where you actually pass a um, your own type down to a base class as a template argument so it can call you back. Um, it's called compile time polymorphism. Well, with deducing this, you don't actually need to do all of that because if you call a base class um, from the perspective of the, the static instance, sorry, the dynamic instance, it gets the dynamic type deduced. So you've already got it there. You don't need to pass it down as part of the type, which makes things so much simpler. And there's, there's loads of other things, uh, recursive lambdas. Um, should, should read the paper because there's just so many things that they discovered that this opened up. So it's one of those um, one of those features that you know it's right because all these things that were being blocked suddenly open up. So it's a really big feature. It's going to again change the way we write a lot of code, and it made it in. Then some smaller things like multi-dimensional subscript operator. Well, that made it in early. And as a result, we've got MD, uh, MD span and MD array for multi-dimensional arrays. Um, I think some of the others I'm going to talk about by example, so let's move on. All right. Yeah, we looked at this example earlier, where we're trying to do our conversion from string to integer, but we want to do error handling. We tried optional, and we said, what if we want to supply a message along with it? We tried variant. It works, but it's a bit clunky. We can do better. In C++23, we can do std expected, which I mean, does the same job, but you can see it's a lot less code. And actually, if you look closely, the only real differences between this and optional are exactly the things that matter. We can specify the error type, we can specify what happens in the error case. And when we're handling it in the error case, we can get the error out. Everything else is just the same as still optional. This is much nicer to work with. It's much more tailored to supporting error handling. 
Now, if you've seen any of my error handling talks, you know we can go even further still. There's proposals for that. I'm not going to get into that now. But this is the great start. So I'm really happy about this. Now, if we go back to the optional version, but this one I looked at earlier, um, there's even more we can do here as well. So in this case, we've got one function that returns an optional parse in. Let's throw in a couple more. Uh, we've got divide, which um, will give you a std unexpected, sorry, a std expected if you, uh, you give it a division by zero. And one more function that doesn't have optional at all, just to see what happens there. Now, with optional today, as of C17 or 20, you would write code that uses these functions like this if you want to compose them together. So we call parse in, we store the result. OK, we can use the initializer syntax to reduce it a bit. Then we test the result. If we've got it, we dereference it and pass it on to divide. We capture the result, test that, dereference that, and pass it on to add one. And then we've got all the error cases. I mean, it's, it's straightforward enough, but it's tedious code to follow. And the more you compose these functions, the, the messier it gets. So C23, we finally got the magnetic operations for std optional. You don't have to know what magnetic functions are to know that you can write code like this. This is the same, same thing. Again, today, C23. Mm -hmm. Again, look at the, the flow. We call parse in, and then we call divide, and then we transform the result of that farad one. It just, it's, it's the right order. So that's a sampling of what we're going to be getting in C23. Unless, of course, we have one of those things where we have to pull everything out at the last minute. I don't think so with these, though. So we, we should be good this time. There's lots more I haven't covered, but that's actually the material that I had prepared for the main talk. I did say I had some bonus material. Uh, have we got time to do a little bit more? How much bonus material? Like maybe five minutes? Five minutes. Brilliant. OK. So I'm going to load something up. OK. Now. So I said I did a, uh, a talk recently on coroutines. One of the reasons I'm interested in coroutines is, well, I don't know if you heard, um, I wrote a test framework a few years ago uh, called Catch. Since I heard about C++ coroutines, I started wondering whether it would actually be a good idea to build a test framework on top of coroutines. What do I mean by that? Well, this is what I had in mind. So. This is just prototype code. In fact, that you can see the whole code base is 150 lines of code, including the entire implementation, including all of the coroutines boilerplate, I should add. So, right, here's a test. Now, the, the one downside is you always have to return something that is a, um, a coroutine task object, local test. But apart from that, this looks very much like catch. If you've, if you've used catch. Um, not sure what, I think this is a problem with, yeah. Ignore the red lines. It does work. So we've got these require macros that allow you to do these comparisons. And if you've used catch, you'll know that what we actually do, we'll skip that for a minute and go to here. So, what happens is it does require, it calls this operator that captures the left-hand side of the expression and returns an expression LHS. And with expression LHS, we then overload various operators. So we've got two here to capture the right-hand side and the operator. So now we're building up our complete expression. We return that as a, an expression with types. That just stores all of the information we've got. That's pretty much how catch works already, obviously a cut down version. What's new here is, if I look in that require again, requires actually doing co-yield. 
So it's yielding out of our co-routing every time you, you do an assertion with this require type and our operator. Now if we look at this usage code, so this is really the, the runner for our test framework, if you like. So we're creating the test object, the test co-routine, and then we just loop through, we keep resuming until resume returns false. So that's gonna keep generating new assertion values. In fact, it returns an assertion info. That's what captures all of that information that we, we saw at the end of the expression decomposition. We get that out here, and we can say, file a line number, because we've got source location now in C20. We've got a string version of the expression and the result, whether it passed or failed. And that's it. Now, the nice thing about this is we were able to get out of our test function without exceptions. In catch, if a, uh, a test case fails early, we have to throw an exception to get out. But now we have another way out. And that's one of the reasons I was interested in this. Because not everywhere lets you use exceptions. There's places that can't use catch as a result. And this would be a really nice way to, to get around that. So it's just a toy thing at the moment. We'll see where it goes. So there, is, there are some limitations. But I just wanted to give you a taste of what you can do with co-routings. And if you're interested, I won't dwell on it too much, but we can actually have a look at the, where is it? Some of the co-routine boilerplate. Here we go. So test is our co-routine task type. It has a promise type where you have, th these are the required functions I have to implement. We've got some custom state. And what happens every time you yield a value? We also have to store a coroutine handle, and this is our API for it. So what happens when you do resume, getting the result, and getting the assertion info. And that's actually all there is to it. Once you do get to grips with coroutines, you, you can actually boil it down to something relatively straightforward. If you've never seen coroutines before, this looks pretty alien, but it's not too bad. But that's, that's it. That's my bonus material as well. So I'm going to just come back here so I can finally say thank you for listening.